Gather round, everybody. For you're about to hear the show that's gonna make you so far from me to hear it on the Ginsburg on the night train show. We're talking with Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg, as he's known to so many people, one of the legendary figures in Boston radio. And Arnie, some people, they say, were just born to do what they ended up doing. Is it fair to say that you might have actually been born to do radio? Yes. And uh, what happened was, when I was a little kid, radio was just about five or six years old when I was born. And when you were born and raised in... I, I grew up in, it's called Chestnut Hill. Sure. Uh, just above, uh, on a hill. Uh, and uh, just above Boston College. I was fascinated with radio from the get-go as a little kid. In fact, I remember the first radio we had, the, uh, the tubes were lit from an automobile battery, six-volt battery, this, this gospel truth. And I would, so the radios were big things then, Wood. You only had one radio in the house in the living room. And I'd stick my head underneath the radio because they, they were, it was, the radio was on legs. Uh, the electron concept of electronics fascinated me. So how old were you when you built your first radio, do you think? Well, that, that was about six or seven years mm -hmm. old. You could buy a kit. So obviously it must have been in your blood that six or seven years old, you're building your own radios. Right, and uh, if there was a place downtown. My father happened to know the owner. It was only one shop known as the Radio Shack, which grew to be the chain. And, uh, the original Radio Shack. The original Radio Shack. <laughs> so at one time there was just yeah. one. Okay. Uh, Toby Deutschman owned the, wow. the Radio Shack. It started it and it grew and grew. And uh, I used to go there my, with my father and, uh, and pick out stuff. And I started building stuff. Somebody said, hey, Arnie, there's a job for an engineer at WMEX in Kenmore Square, Boston. And I got, a, got in and said, I, I'm in high school, but uh, I'd like to work weekend. And I got the job. And I immediately set out to get what they call a first class license, mm -hmm. which meant you could run any transmitter in the world. So <laughs> uh, I worked as an engineer and uh, had a little consulting company and uh, uh, got licenses for people for FM stations, which were really just starting up, and AM stations. And I started a station in Sanford, Maine, WSME, in 1957, I think it was. And uh, that's part one of the story, my electronics. So that, you actually got involved in radio as a technician, not as a personality. That's right. And I could have gotten into probably almost any college in America, but I stayed with it. Your parents, I, I, I didn't go. Well, you know, now, of course, radio is so established and so respected, but my guess is at that time, your parents must have thought you, you might as well have just as run off and join the circus as to go into radio. It really yeah. wasn't highly regarded at that point, was it? So you're now a technician at WMEX and a teenager. Yeah, and I would left that. I started my own little company and I built recording studios. I'm one of the investors in the Sanford station and, and I were friends and he said, why don't you use the, we got a spare office. So I was running my little company out of the radio station and the station, had, WBOS was all foreign language. And foreign language, uh, you know, Italian and uh, Greek and uh, there was the Irish Hour and all that, and now where was WBOS in those days? It was right opposite the new Boston University buildings on Commonwealth Avenue. So, 1956, uh, the manager said to me, "Arnie, we're going to we're going to cut out a lot of the uh, foreign language programming because it just isn't supporting the people doing it or, or us, and I want to put on rock and roll." And, uh, Pretty daring in and I'd like you to program it Wow! and uh, to do a DJ show in the morning. 
I said, in the morning? I, I can't get up in the morning. He said, no, you've got to do it in the morning. I said, I can't. So uh, he said, why? I said, I just know that if I get up in the morning, I don't, I'm very slow waking up and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I, I said, why do you want me on in the morning? He said, because I have a great name for the show, Get Up with Ginsburg. So I said, well, I want to do go to bed with Ginsburg and do the evening show. And if it's going to be real rock and roll, it's going to have a younger audience who'd be doing homework and all that. And uh, that's how he went on the air, as, just as a sideline, as a joke. Seven nights a week I was on. Oh, boy. And, I, and the program director, too. And the program director, wow. which was bas basically music director. Mm -hmm. And it caught on almost immediately. Were there any other stations in Boston at that point that were seriously playing rock and roll? Yeah, there was a station playing all rock and roll top 40. And uh, So what made your show catch on? What made it catch on is, first of all, I said, this is for kids doing homework. They don't want to hear the news every half hour or hour and the weather every 10 minutes and all that. So I'd say on my show, well, it's 9 o'clock and time for the news. If you want to hear the news, tune to 10.30, WBZ. <laughs> Bang. And I was very lucky that that, and I could play whatever I wanted. I was Do you remember program the first director. song you played? Huh? Do you remember the first song you played? It was probably Elvis Presley. Yeah, exactly. Elvis was just starting, and I was aware that he was making a noise a little bit of a noise. Could, could you tell he was going to explode the way I just did? knew. I said, this is something good. And uh, I <laughs> uh, played heavily and told the whole, our whole crew, play a lot of Elvis. And the timing was right. Yeah. And uh, Elvis was getting a lot of negative publicity. And uh, with the adults... <laughs> who became the, his biggest fans. And the thing just caught, caught on right away, and the commercials were directed towards that age group. And it, it just was a lot of fun and a lot of corny jokes. And I, I did it for fun, literally, because there wasn't much money in that at that time. And it was a lousy signal, too, at, at night, 1600 on the dial, way up at the end of the AM dial. But... It caught on, and uh, eventually it kept growing and growing, and I got a lot of good sponsors. And WMEX went on the air with rock and roll, and I thought that MEX was a much better signal. And do you remember what year WMEX came on the that air playing rock and roll? That was about 57 or 58. I was on WBOS for... And that's BOSA. Two, two and a half or three years. I, I went over and right away took the uh, uh, eight to ten period. Now, did they contact you or did you contact them? How did that work? How did you make that uh, Joe Smith, yes. who became head of, oh, my. Uh, of uh, one of the big record companies. Warner called, Brothers, I think, was yeah, it? Yeah, Warner Brothers yeah. and the whole chain. He, he called me and said, Arnie, I'm taping a show in New York and putting it on to do on it. MEX, and this is crazy, I can't, why don't you go see the owner? Well, the owner was uh, well known for being very, uh, a tightwad. Thrifty? Very thrifty. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't wear a kilt either. The, and anyway, uh, the thing was, I went over to see Mac Richmond, and I said, uh, Mac, I want to move my show over here. Because... Uh, and he was the only, owner? Mac Richmond, Mac Richmond was the owner? Mac Richmond was okay. the owner. And uh, his brother managed the station. Mac Richmond was from Washington, D.C. and had a uh, rock and roll station on in Washington that was very popular. So uh, he said, well, you know, we can't pay very much. I said, well, I don't want to get paid. And he, well, yeah. I said, I want 25% of the commercial time on my show. He said, it's a deal. Now, what made you decide to do that, Arnie? Because that wasn't 
the way because I'd heard what a tightwad he was. Oh, okay. And uh, he was struggling with the station. Anyway, it caught on big almost overnight and went right up the uh, the whole New England coast. Now, uh, MEX at that point was it? How, how strong was the signal? Was it was it fifty? It was five thousand watts. Five thousand watts. But the signal in the daytime was pretty good. Yeah. And at the beaches and re resorts, and you, you'd walk the beaches, well, any time, and you'd hear wall to wall WMEX. So the show caught on. It uh, had as high as a forty to fifty, no, thirty-five to forty percent share of the audience, which is unheard of. Of course, it was a young audience, but. It reached a lot of people. Thirty-five to forty percent of the audience. Yeah, at that time. I've got the uh, pulse uh, the measurements for it. So now, when you were getting it first established uh, as a DJ, did you have role models? Were there other people that were affecting you or influencing you in some way or another? Who were the people that uh, laid the groundwork for you? Murray, Murray the K. Oh, all right, on, New York guys. And huh? before that, Alan Freed. Sure. Uh, they were they were on in New York, and they would played a little different music, a, a lot of the rhythm and blues. Whereas what I played was the combination of rhythm and blues and country, which was sort of the Elvis Presley and the Chuck Berry and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and, yeah. and that whole uh, that whole group. So uh, I didn't try to imitate them because I didn't want to. All I knew was that what I did, and I told corny jokes, and there was no news on my show either. And that was intentional, right? You didn't want news? It was intentional. That uh -huh. People had heard all the news they wanted, and of course, television had taken over with the adults. What I really had was, as a result of the end of World War II, was something called the baby boomer. The audience was there, and they were really into music, and they were all, the parents wanted the kids to study, and they were all doing, a lot doing homework, listening to my show, and, the, and uh, it just went straight ahead with a lot of fun, and I'd have people in the studio, uh, listeners who'd just wander in, and I'd put them on for a minute and have them do commercials, and it, it just was great. Well, one night, Someone walked in the studio with a piece of metal, and he said, Arnie, I was just at a recording studio at a record studio, and they use a sound effect, and your show is called The Night Train. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. Now, how did He's, you come up with the name The Night Train? I, my theme song was The Night okay. Train, right. an old Buddy Morrow or a Glenn Miller song. Sure. It's been recorded. And uh, he said, I got this. This. I said, what is it? He said, it's a train whistle. <laughs> so he said, you can be, you can go woo-woo go all the time. And that's how I became woo-woo Ginsburg. So that's, so someone came in just off the street with it right. and said, you can go woo-woo. Oh boy. Yeah. So anyway, it started out with this and the woo-woo and the woo-woo became more and more popular. Then I added uh, more sounds. I added a, a, I'm a honky. Now, did people just bring those in or did you come across these? How some did you come up I with got, the sound uh, 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 some I went to a, a well known music store that carried stuff that supplied the Boston Pops Orchestra. Oh. And, uh, 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 but there were things like this slide whistle. <laughs> Your host. Up and down the New England coast. And then I said, everything's ducky here tonight. <coughs> and uh, what else I had? Uh, we did give time quite frequently on the air. The WMEX cuckoo <coughs> time is 9.56. And uh, then I had... Uh, a lot of you people uh, like my show... But uh, you said there's a lot of stuff on it that you don't like. So this is what the... It's a bull bell. Oh, I was going to say, more cowbell. Cowbell. 
<laughs> and then uh, I'd say, and now another blast from the past. And these things would really go through. This one, you remember there was commercial, kids had one major problem, a fair percentage of them, which was complexion problems. Yep. And there was Stridex, Pfizer, Hex, Clearasil. And I'd go like this, hey kids, do you have pimples? There's the solution. Uh, anyway, it was that kind of silliness. Now, people take this all for granted now because they've heard this a lot. And they've maybe heard other DJs, but this was all new at the time, wasn't it? I mean, it wasn't, people you were all making their own way, weren't they, in radio at that point? And this was still a hobby with me. I still had other stuff going on, but it got bigger and bigger. And... Uh, the, there was a sponsor on, came to me because they knew I had a big audience and the automobile was big in the 60s, mm -hmm. bigger, you know, the kids could buy automobiles and for a few bucks and register them. And, and uh, this John Anasoulis, who had a restaurant on Route 1 in Saugus, called Adventure Car Hop. Yeah. Oh, Adventure Car Hop is the place to go for food that's always right. Hi there, this is Arnie Ginsberg telling you that Adventure Car Hop presents for the first time anywhere, the <laughs> Ginsberger. And he said, Arnie, I think you can bring me a lot of customers. He said it's tough running a drive-in restaurant because it was something new. So uh, he said, if you got some idea, he said, I'll go along with whatever you say. He said, I'd even do a two-for-one special. So I said, I have an idea. Let's do it if you go out to Adventure Car Hop and say, woo-woo Ginsburg, you'll get another hamburger free of charge, or whatever the special was that night. And other times, so we said, okay. Well, it really caught on. And sure when the Beatles were big, uh, we'd give away a beetle wig with every Hamburg. And uh, the biggest item, I mean, you'd never know what would go over big. The biggest item they ever had just captured the adult and teenage imagination. And believe it or not, it was a Japanese back scratcher, which is a stick of wood with a little, it looks like Shaped ivory. like a hand. Uh, that... We couldn't get enough of it. That's them. hysterical. Now, a lot of people may not know what a car hop is now. And a car, car hop was you basically drove in to the parking lot. Right. And you just stayed there in your car. And it was like a drive-in movie to the extent that there were loudspeakers hanging beside your car. And you would call in your order. Yeah. And if at the end of the order you said, Woo Woo Ginsburg, and you ordered the special of the night, you'd get another order free of charge. And uh, this adventure car hop was on the whole, st not only on my show, on weekends they'd run it around the clock. Mm -hmm. And people would come down from Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont or make their f folks, instead of going around what, Route 128, make them drive down Route 1 in Saugus <laughs> and <laughs> go to adventure car hop. And it just caught on and to this day, People that I meet are, uh, oh, you're Arnie Ginsburg, and they start singing the Adventure Car Hop commercial. And it has never left anyone's mind uh, who grew up with this Adventure Car Hop uh, commercial. Yeah, if you heard it, it always it stuck in there. And that's probably the earliest, let me say how I want to phrase this, the earliest example of. Um, a business advertising on radio and skyrocketing purely because of the power of AM radio. I can't think of another business in the Boston area that happened. I think Adventure Car Hop was, was the first one where purely because of their presence of mind to advertise heavily in radio and promote with you, boom. I mean, they took off. They were just, they were, they were hot as lava for the longest oh, time. Oh, yeah. I did. Uh, they were on for a long time. And it's... Uh, Surprising, I mean, you, you know, you don't know who's listening yeah. to your show. Isn't that the beauty of radio? And the f funny thing is, uh, in 
around 1985, I guess, somebody said to me, uh, Arnie Ginsberg, do you know that you're in one of Stephen King's books? I said, no. Well, Stephen King grew up in Maine, and our signal went up, but he was further than Bangor, and he lived somewhere around... Yeah, around Bangor. Bangor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I got a copy of, of it, and sure enough, he uh, had a whole section on uh, the show with Arnie Ginsberg, MC, and Jerry Lee Lewis, the Penguins, and all that. And then he writes about the only connection that this mythical kid had in his story uh, the only connection he had with, with rock and roll that Tansy had to hear it was uh, the uh, American Bandstand on Channel 7 and WMEX out of Boston when Arnie Ginsberg's voice came wavering in and out like the voice of a ghost called up at a seance. <laughs> Typical thing, Yeah, right? and, and uh, it was uh, just great. And I know when Stephen King is interviewed about influences on him, he mentions me. And he, uh, he's been very upfront about him being a real music hound. Yeah, well, he and plays, he has a yeah? sure. band, and uh, he's been a, a great influence. Then another thing, a couple of years ago, Boston Magazine had the uh, Best of Boston mm -hmm. on it, and it had Conan O'Brien and Dennis Leary and Jay Leno. Kings of Boston. Uh, Conan, Conan O'Brien graduated from my high school. We had, we had a good school, and that's the school that had the radio thing sure. going when I was uh, in, uh, in, in high school. But anyway, I, I was reading the best of... That's when they asked people, uh, famous people, what their favorite things are around Boston. And they asked Jay Leno, Leno uh, what his favorite res restaurant was in Boston. And he said, well, I like places in the North End. That's where the Italian restaurants are. But when I was a kid, we used to go to Adventure Car, Car Hop, where Woo Woo Ginsburg was a DJ, and every meal was served on a record album. But he, he never forgot. So he talked about you. You had authors like Stephen King. You had now comedians like Jay Leno, who grew up listening to WMEX and to Arnie Wu Ginsburg. And uh, when there were a series of recreations of classic radio shows released in the '70s, the, the so-called Cruising series, you were one of the uh, the DJs so honored, weren't you? Yeah, this uh, was interesting. In 1970. Uh, a group in, uh, out in the West Coast, uh, they had some syndicated programming, some good syndicated programming, and they had the idea to put out an album called the Cruisin' Series, Cruisin' meaning to cruise around in your car. Mm -hmm. And they had it from 1956 to 1962. The, the idea was that you recreated your radio show from a certain year. They picked out a different disc jockey, and I was picked out to do 1961. Uh, I see from the advertisement they're featuring the all-time hits and America's greatest DJs. Naturally. So you went in and recreated the show. They didn't just have tapes of your show then, huh? No, no. I went in. I flew out to the West Coast. Oh. I got the old WMEX jingles. No I had I had the commercials for Adventure Car Hop. They got the real commercials for uh, in 61 wide track Pontiac and uh, the Ford Falcon or something. Yeah, Falcon, one of the actual commercials. Wow. And they paid royalties to the people who performed on those national commercials. Nice. They, they got the co commercials from that era. Yeah. So you have, and, and I look through the old 1961 newspapers to see what the Celtics were doing oh, and, uh, and what was playing at the drive-ins, which was Jerry Lewis and some, someone. What was the AM radio scene like in Boston at that time? Because now, as you're getting into the early 60s, it's really not just you anymore. It's not a fly-by-night operation. So the, the success of Adventure Car Hop and a couple of other things, this has now become some of the golden days. What was it like in Boston? Well. Radio dominated, originally dominated, and daytime and nighttime entertainment mm -hmm. because there was no TV. Mm -hmm. Well, the TV 
took the adults away at night, or at least people said, radio will be dead in five years. Yeah. Well, it's still alive and yeah. The iPod was going to do that too. Well, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, FM was available, but they had jokes. FM, that stands for foreign music or uh, FM funny music, you know, with classical music or... Yeah, that, that was, or, that was uh, an odd duck at that point in or, time. Or uh, wall-to-wall elevator music. Because no one really had FM receivers at that point, did they? Didn't see the need no, for No, I them. had them. <laughs> did you? Yeah. yeah. And I got FM stations for people, got them licenses and so forth. And uh, But radio itself, stations really went after, started to go after a specific age group, yeah. women 18 to 34, or women 25 to 49, which is the disabled group because they're buying for the whole family. So that's when the demographics started to yeah. pop up at that point. And then uh -huh. there were sports programs on not just the actual sporting events, but sports talk programs starting on uh, talk shows. And then later on, of course, uh, stations went all sports with talk and calling. <clears throat> and uh, uh, radio, FM offered a lot of alternatives uh, for listeners who were in, in the car. People, er, every car had FM in it. Uh, and AM naturally. That's we're talking later in the 60s, I guess, 67, right, 68. Right. So now, how much did the Beatles change everything? The Beatles, I, I, I have a theory that Chubby Checker and the Beatles affected rock and roll music and, <coughs> pardon me, and music in general. But I say Chubby Checker because the uh, Teen teenage music would, uh, you'd have a, a cutoff of age. Uh, but when the, uh, the twist, Chubby Checker's twist, yeah. there were nightclubs open, people were dancing the twist, sure. adults were dancing. Yeah. And that meant that uh, there, the, the whole audience, the, that uh, Perry Como and Doris Day and all of them, they were, they were gone. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was a new type of music. So, and what, so the, rock and roll was no longer just youth music. Right, the Everly Brothers yeah. country music was in there. Yeah. And if you liked a little country music. And it, it, pop music became uh, pretty widespread. And then when the Beatles came, the Beatles attracted all kinds of, all age groups. They were fascinated by the phenomenon, but also the music is really what fascinated them. Yeah. They loved it. The creative albums they did. And then music began to splinter and FM had uh, stations like WBCN in Boston that were called alternative music stations. And uh, uh, there was only one real pop AM station on, on AM for a while, WRKO, and the uh, the whole mix was was changing, and FM was getting the younger listeners to and a lot of the the elders. Uh, so people tend to forget that they think of WBZ now as this very uh, popular and uh, staid news station, and WRKO as a talk station, but they were all playing rock and roll, weren't they? They were all pe playing yeah. some form of pop music and uh, uh, it changed, there was a lot of variety and the whole generation grew, that grew up with rock and roll were ready to accept new forms of, of, uh, of music. So that's what happened and it's continuously changing. Then as the recording quality of the actual albums improved, well then FM had the better sound quality in people's minds, so that was a factor, but you must have some Beatles stories. Something funny happened in 1964. Uh, I was the MC for the Beatles 
in Boston Garden and at Suffolk Downs. Both of the shows, my, yeah. my. And uh, also someone from WBZ. We were co, but anyway, I was there on stage and so forth. And, but the Boston Garden one, the first show, was outrageous, mostly teenage girls. Somehow their folks we, we wheedled the, uh, the seats up front. And uh, it happened that in 1964, Ford was introducing the Mustang. Yeah. And I was invited to go out to the Ford plant for four or five days. They were throwing a big party to introduce this new car. And uh, we we're going to be invited to drive around the tracks and everything. So <laughs> uh, I go out there, and of course, Ford did things, you know, with. Uh, Detroit style, and there was, there was lots of booze and and so forth, and it was a lot of fun and all in uh, good taste and so forth. And the Mustang really looked hot; it was going to be a star. So uh, I had to. It was ending on Saturday at noon, and I was to take a plane back from Detroit to Boston. Uh, and to be the MC for the Beatles. And my plane, I didn't really look where it was coming from, but it was coming from Japan. And there had been some kind of torrential rain and storms somewhere along the route. And my plane was late. And I waited around the airport, and finally this Northwest area plane from Japan arrived. There are about 12 people aboard. And the uh, stewardesses, as they call them, then, were apologizing. And they said, we're going to give everyone as much champagne as you want. OK. So I said, all right. And I, I'm not a heavy drinker, but I had a few glasses of champagne, which to me is a lot. And I get to Boston Garden at 7.45 and grab a cab. I mean, get, get to Logan Airport, mm -hmm. grab a cab and arrive in time to introduce the Beatles. And I was tired and I was drunk. So <laughs> I, I wasn't drunk. I just was exhausted yeah. from the, uh, the, uh, the thing. And I wanted to sit down. And I had a seat reserved in the front row. Well, a Boston Globe photographer, whoever it was, in those days, you, they took a picture, and there was no internet to send the picture back. They'd rush someone back with the... Yeah, uh, they have a runner. With yeah. The, yeah, yeah, they were runners and develop it, and it was for the Sunday Morning Globe. Well, the next morning, I go to the door to get the Sunday Globe, and uh, on the front page was Astonishing Human... Storm. Storm, yes, it, and it really was. And all these girls, they were standing up on the chairs screaming, and there was confetti falling, and they they were holding their heads like this, screaming, and what they called swooning, which was just collapsing on their chairs. And there if, you are. if you see this guy, I don't know if you can see it with the camera, there's this guy who was very quiet, and it says... What the Beatles saw and heard in Boston Gardens Saturday night. And then it says, only the man at right remains calm as quartet appears. And that was me. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know who it was. You, you, you know, whoever oh, that's very got funny. the picture, you know, at the paper. Yeah. Well, this is a picture of, uh, and uh, I, I, I never forgot that. Front page of the Boston Globe. Not bad at all. Above the fold, as they <laughs> yeah. say in the uh, newspaper business. Uh, you, you, you talked earlier about how radio began making the transition from AM to FM in the late 60s and early 70s. And now a lot of the, the AM personalities and AM stations were caught completely flat-footed by this, but you've always been able to stay kind of like ahead a of the curve here, aren't you? Because you were involved in the early years of WBCN as well, which of course is one of the um, outstanding FM underground rock stations. No, of I, all I time. wasn't there very, very long. It was been the station was going to be 
uh, sold to the uh, new group. And uh, how did you get involved with the station? How did you end up there? Ray Reapin. Okay. At that point, you mm -hmm. left the airwaves. Huh? You're no longer on the air. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I was at BCN, and it 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 just didn't work out, and wasn't uh, going to to. And uh, I said, I I think I should leave, <laughs> which is, <laughs> <laughs> and no one disagreed with me. <laughs> anyway, I I went over to. Uh, uh, Medford, where WHIL was, and uh, they had an FM signal that really wasn't good. It was in their backyard, and they moved that up to uh, the top of the Prudential Tower, and it uh, became, uh, was sold, and uh, became KISS 108. And I was one of the owners of KISS. I had an interest in it, and it grew and added, uh, it became the Pyramid Broadcasting, and we had stations in Chicago, Philadelphia, Rochester, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Charlotte. Did we leave out? Anyway, uh, a lot of stations, and that was uh, finally sold about uh, so eight, eight or nine years ago. So again, you were on the front of the wave of the whole FM Top 40 dance movement, too, with KISS, because KISS, again, is one right. of the legendary was, stations. It, KISS came in. We spent a million dollars on advertising the first year with mm -hmm. billboards and so forth. And, Unheard of at the time. Yeah. And uh, that, that was a lot of, well, it still is a lot of money to, <laughs> to spend. And it was uh, very well done and a lot of, a lot of fun. And we had good people. Uh, Matty in the morning, and, Sonny uh, Joe. Dale Dorman, Sonny Joe White was there for a long time. And, and the whole thing was, uh, it was a fun station and we did a lot of outside promotion with concerts and, and so forth. It was good. In 1985, I left KISS and uh, joined uh, John Garabedian, who had a TV license, and we built a TV station. And from the ground up, literally, finding a place to put a tower, we wanted to put up a 1,200-foot tower. You can't do it anywhere. Yeah, not the easiest place to... to we found a place. That's taller than the Empire State Building. Oh, no kidding. And uh, the... Uh, so where did you find it? Where did you put it? In Hudson, Massachusetts. Oh. And uh, that uh, it, it it worked out okay. The it, it, to be a music video station, V66, you really couldn't. Right? Pardon? V sixty six. V sixty six. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was fairly popular, but there was not enough advertising. Not going to be enough to support. We had sixty six employees, coincidentally, and uh, it's very expensive running it. TV station, and the advertising revenue available for that age group is not, even in a major market, is not enough. So you said that was 86? Uh, yeah, 85, 85 we started. So it, it was at the, at the height of the whole new wave uh, MTV video revolution. So this was actually a, radio, uh, a, rather a television station that was doing music videos 24-7. Right, over the air. Yep, and the also, commercial airways. And also carried on cable. Yeah. And we, we had a great staff, and everything was great about it, except there was just not enough advertising. It, it, you, you just can't support a station like that, even in a market the size of Boston. Uh, you, if you cover the whole country on cable, you can do it now. Of course, yeah. they did it. But even uh, we had people who said, that this would be just a fad. And if you look at MTV today, they have just a little bit of music video on, and the rest is all lifestyle or a situation, and uh, it's still going for certain, the same age group in a way. And, uh, but uh, music video is passe. 
I think people became bored with it easily. As you see a video three times. It's the novelty and, of it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, and we sold that to uh, Home Shopping Network. We were lucky. So AM, FM, TV. TV. Uh, dabbled in all, all of it. And I also uh, did specials for WBZ for a couple of years, Saturday specials, oh. while I was at, at, at KISS. Wow. So I've, I've always been part of the radio industry from the technical end, through the uh, programming end, through the management and ownership operation. And I've always said that I, I never was interested, never wanted to do anything. I never thought I made a mistake even when I made mistakes uh, in, in doing it, because it, it was just a lot, of, a lot of fun, a lot of challenge, and uh, it's like being on an endless treadmill, a good one. What was, uh, is it easy to think about what it might have been your best day on the air or, and your worst day on the air? Yeah, the day that uh, I and Dick Clark and Murray the K and so forth were summoned to Washington for the uh, payola? payola hearings. Whoa. You know, you get scared. It was during an election season and... Uh, so what year was this now? 1960. So you had to go down, you had to appear before Congress. Yeah, before the uh, Congressional Investigating Committee. And some were found guilty and fined or fired and so forth. And I was, did not get into trouble with it. And also anything that could even have been considered had been reported to the uh, IRS. And it really wasn't very much, but uh, I, must, well, must mainly because I, 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 I never wanted anyone telling me what to play because... That was the fun of it. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that qualifies as a worst day. How about best day? Well, there were two best days. One is the day that uh, V66, the music video station, went on the air. Because oh. we worked hard. We had to raise... 10 really 20 million dollars and the uh, the investors all got their money back with uh, profit and the other one was the first day of kiss 108 two very momentous occasions in the history of boston media actually for yeah. two very different reasons interesting do you, do you have favorite performers or favorite records now to this day? The, the so-called Desert Island lists. If you're going to have you list some of your favorite acts and some of your favorite records, they don't have to be the same. You may have a favorite act. And no, there, there were a lot of good actors, and they all work hard. I mean, God. But I really like the Stones, yeah. Rolling Stones. Satisfaction the... still sounds great to me. Now, you were at the Manning Bowl, were you? I was at the Manning Bowl. Mick Jagger and I got tear-gassed. Now, not many people get to say that. Yeah, and I mean really tear gas. It was in Lynn, and it was one of their first shows in America, I think. Right, time, and right? They, they were late because they had landed in New York <coughs> and had... Uh, and they ended up it was Manning foggy Bowl because no one else would pick them anywhere, was, right? Manning Bowl was in Lynn, yeah. and it's a football yeah. bowl where Lynn schools play football, but it can handle a pretty good crowd. And what happened was the Rolling Stones plane probably arrived on time, but they, in, in New York, I think they'd come in from London, mm. and they had to fly to Boston, but there was fog. And uh, this was doing an outdoor show in the fog and mist and so forth, and they got there about an hour and a half late. And the audience, uh, what had happened was the Lynn police had never really dealt with the rock and roll show before and they put up these this little 63, sawhorses 
oh, to keep people back from the stage. Boy. So naturally, when the stones get going, the crowd pushes forward and they push these little saw horses, which a 10 year old <laughs> could move. And uh, I don't think they, they didn't try to get on the stage. The police didn't know what to do because they knew they wanted to keep a space between the saw horses and then the, uh, and the stage. And uh, so they decided tear gas. So when in doubt, tear gas. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, uh, luckily, no one. No one was hurt. The concert was canceled. I couldn't drive a car for an hour. It was because of the effects of the tear gas. Yeah. Wow. And uh, my, my, so my guess is you never got a chance to talk to the Stones either, even though you emceed the show. Well, I talked to them a little before. Oh, really? I had, uh, met Mick before he recorded some voice tracks for me, but uh, it was just one of those things that. Uh, uh, it, it, it had happened, and Jagger still talks about getting tear gassed. Other favorite uh, bands or acts over the years? What do you play for music when you just want to relax now? I usually listen to radio do you? Still. in the car. Huh? And I like to push the buttons around and hear how uninteresting a lot of radio is there's still pretty good choice of music, but it is really uninteresting, or maybe we just had so much radio that uh, uh, use it. I will even listen to Rush Limbaugh to grind my teeth. Yikes. But uh, What is it about radio that makes it special and unique? What is it that makes it such a... Uh, an unto Originally, itself. they didn't know how to describe radio until someone said, it's the theater of your mind. Oh, yeah. When they did all these shows that are on TV, they were the equivalent of that on radio. They would have half hour or one hour radio shows and plays, dramas, and uh, mysteries. Yeah, it wasn't and your mind, and they had sound effects. Mm. Lots of sound effects, and they call they call that the theater of your mind, and you could listen to radio, listen for an hour to what might be considered a boring mystery or a love story or whatever it is, and it would hold you because you're supplying. It it, it would be. No, not like watching a movie soundtrack. It was radio doing its job. And uh, naturally, music made sense. Uh, but uh, there were almost every show that was on early television, television early days, had been on radio. Now, you talked a little bit earlier about uh, how they've, uh, naysayers have claimed about the impending death of radio a number of different times. Uh, why is radio still relevant today? I'm not sure. But uh, people, some people use it for sports. Uh, they've, they've sort of gone into their own compartments. Uh, radio used to have a lot of different elements to it. Cooking shows and, well, what TV has now, a lot of those programs <laughs> were on uh, on on radio, but uh, radio is basically programmed for a specific audience with specific type of programming with very little variety on a given station and a variety of stations. We've, uh, and it, it survives, but it's not surviving like it used to. Now, when you look back at... Um the golden days of AM. We're talking, the, as you mentioned, during the late 50s, early 60s. Was it, in your mind, a very special time for pop culture and for music and for the media, or was it just Well, it was much thing? more narrow yeah. than today. You had a much larger audience, huh? So you could have a yeah, much yeah, larger they, impact on people? Right. You know, basically until... 
68, 69, 70. FM didn't, it, it existed, but, uh, and, and then it came through like gangbusters. So that uh, people live with FM and AM has talk shows and so forth, the foreign language uh, programs on some of the smaller stations or community stations. But it, it's, it's different. We've got lots of choice for information. It's like asking about the newspapers. Well, their readership is down considerably. And uh, Where do you think radio is going? It's not radio. It's programming. You, you know, you can get on my computer, I can get all kinds of programming from all over the world. And uh, it's every, everybody, there's a lot of personal listening. I mean, small groups of people listening to what attracts them. And uh, it works differently. And it seems to have always evolved and survived. Yeah. I mean, when, when I was a kid, we had radio and we had movies. And some big cities like Boston had uh, live theater, you know, musicals and dramas, and you'd go to the theater to see it. But radio, it was actually a small amount of information, amusement, and everything else that we had compared to today. Today, everyone can have, almost have their own, create their own composite of listening, which is much broader than was available in the, in the, in the uh, old days or the original days. Just another question about, again, the, 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 the golden days of MEX and, and AM. Was, was there a lot of competition? Was there friendly rivalries? Did the jocks hate each other? Did they were all on the same page? Because you had people like Carl DeSouza and Ron Landry and, and yourself and John Garabedian was in there at, at, at some point and so many of the, uh, the, the DJs, uh, Dale Dorman. Uh, uh, was there a lot of competition? Was there, uh, was there yeah, friendly rivalries? Was, uh, were those crazy times? Did anyone just go about doing their business? Well, it, it, was, it, it was pretty good uh, competition in Boston. It really wasn't cutthroat, but they didn't really love each other, <laughs> the, di the different stations. But uh, it was pretty civil. Like Congress used to be, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had some. We're very lucky. We had some good people in Boston. People who were good for New England, for Boston, and uh, we had people over the years like Bob and Ray, who uh, uh, they they went to New York and they did national uh, uh, things and. So, but over, overall, I would say we were, I, I think we were pretty friendly unless somebody really tried to get your audience by duplicating you and doing either a better or a worse job. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Arnie, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us because you've captured a very important piece and place and time in the musical history of New England. And now, since it's time for us to sign off, can you give us a sign off? Yeah, I can give you a sign off. It says, well, first of all, thank you for uh, doing this interview. And to anybody watching, I'll be wooing you. <laughs> can't they get, get any better than that? <laughs> Can't make any better than that. Personalized. There yeah. Nice yeah. So come on, honey. Let's go. Oh.